let's get to the heart of all the shows we saw, starting with The Heart of Rock and Roll, which is an original stage musical inspired by the songs of Huey Lewis and the News. The book is by Jonathan Abrams, and the story is by Tyler Mitchell and Jonathan Abrams, and it's directed by Gordon Greenberg with fabulous choreography by Lauren Lataro. The Heart of Rock and Roll is just great entertainment. At the heart of the story is Bobby, played by Corey Cott, who is working at a box factory, only then to find himself pivoting and reinventing himself. Along the way, there are twists and turns with romantic interests, um, with new career opportunities, and of course, with rock and roll. The show is great for lovers of 80s music and 80s nostalgia, costumes, of course, reminiscent from that period. There's laughs throughout, sprinkled throughout the, stri- the script. Eva, of course, was unable to contain her enthusiasm and laughter throughout the, the viewing. Um, I'm, of course, not a product of the 80s, so my connection to the show was different than older audiences who will have been familiar with that period. And, of course, those who are fans of Huey Lewis and the News will enjoy this show, much like the music and score of Back to the Future. It's a crowd-pleasing musical, perfect entertainment. For me, it's a happy face. Bobby Stivic, played by Corey Cott, works in a box factory. You know, they make cardboards to make boxes so that people can package their products. And it's run by John Dossett and uh, his daughter, played by Mackenzie Kurtz, who's very buttoned up and does all the numbers and everything. But she wants to do sales and Bobby wants to do sales. And he keeps coming up with schemes that blow up in his face. He ends up getting fired. So he thinks he might go back to his old band, The Loop that he hasn't played with in 10 years, but they, they're forming again. But then he comes up with an ad- idea at a convention for boxes and everything, because Roz, his friend in home and human resources, lets him tag along even though he's been fired. And he approaches Otto Fjord, played by Orville Mendoza, who has like an Ikea kind of company and strikes up a deal with him that the daughter helps slam dunk into happening. So now he's got this conflict, Bobby Stivic. Is he going to like stay with being a sales representative and, and save the company? Or is he going to stay with this band and save the band? And meanwhile, he's kind of interested in the daughter, but the daughter is ca- caught up with this rich, crappy guy, Tucker, who's really annoying. And so what's going to happen to all these people and will people get what they really want and who will they get hurt and how does it get solved? But I made a remark to Benjamin that I thought was pretty funny because Jan and I saw The Outsiders and it seems like this season, it's all like poor people are were rooting for the working class and boo to the rich people. But the only people that can afford these shows are rich people. So this is to me the very definition of irony so i'm giving this i think i gave it a major happy face and i really want people to go see this this wonderful production of greece presently at the algonquin arts theater in manasquan new jersey takes us back to the 1959 graduation at rydell high school the time of souped up cars and hubcaps black leather jackets school dances drive-in movies and it's been over 50 years since the original stage show of Grease and over 45 years since the very large grossing movie. The leads of Danny Zuko and Sandy Dombrowski were played by the brilliant husband and wife team of Rob Ryan and Alicia Rose Ryan and directed brilliantly by Ian Moore. The Danny that I recall was the same wise guy and macho man as in the uh, show and the movie, but um, under um, Ian's direction here, Rob Ryan's acting ability came out to present a vulnerability and a sensitivity, which in fact was depicted by his solo alone at a drive-in movie, and we can appreciate him more as a human being. Alicia Rose Ryan has some wonderful vocal chops as Sandy, showing us her sentimentality and such emotion with Hopelessly Devoted to You and the very haunting It's Raining on Prom Night. Nick Ambrosia does a wonderful job as good buddy Kanicki, 
and um, does his grace, Grease Lightning brilliantly with the introduction of Rizzo in that same song. Talking of Rizzo, Betty Rizzo, known just as Rizzo, very much is like her Stocker Channing character in the movie, sort of a devil may care attitude, but later on she shows her vulnerability with her very poignant, there are the worst things I can do. And arguably my favorite song in the entire show is Look at Me, I'm Sandra D, which originally Rizzo sings to mock Sandy, but then toward the end, Sandy does a reprise as she turns into um, very much from the poignant, the, the very shy young lady into the leather pants wearing Sandy, who's heavily made up. The ensemble was very lively and energetic, um, particular attention to the brother and sister team of Ed Ite and his sister, Jackie Ite, as Sonny Lettieri and Patty Simcox, the, um, the uh, cheerleader full of school spirit. And they were both amazing in the song, Born to Hand Jive, showing enormous, uh, wonderful choreography. Also um, outstanding was the resident nerd, valedictorian Eugene Florzik, played brilliantly um, by the comic Joseph Ryan. It was a wonderful production, playing at the Algonquin until May 19th, a sold out production, but there may be some seats available after some cancellations. I give it a happy face plus. This is Mark Savitt's review of Ife Olajobi's Jordans, which is a very broad and absurdist treatment of a privileged white production company that ignores their hardworking black female Jordan who does the grunt work. Instead, they hire a black male Jordan to seek profits from luring black clients. The female Jordan makes less money and knows more than the clueless male Jordan. What will happen to the dynamics now? While the theme of the invisibility of the black underlings is a good one, the wannabe funny broad absurdist treatment tended to discredit it. The commodification of black culture and black people in a white business is also of interest, but not as presented here. Naomi Lurley's Jordan is a gifted actress, and Mark enjoyed watching her balletic mastery of her office task. If the play had focused more on making us observe behavior, we would have understood and respected the important themes much better. The script is the most annoying and detestable text that I have encountered in the theater. I really hated this play on Happy Face Minus. And also playing at the public, which sounds like a much better play, is Suzanne Laurie Park's Sally and Tom, directed by Stephen H. Broadnax. And it's it's about, it's a we see this play going on about you know Sally Hemings and Thomas Jefferson and the plight of slaves and how you know the Declaration and, and Constitutions basically they should they should be free but they're not but but then it gets interrupted and it turns into it's uh, actors putting on a play about Sally and Tom so you have this backstage drama you have the onstage drama and it's very good and I'm going to talk about it more on our next show June first. But in the meantime, you really forget Jordan, go see Sally and Todd. They sound like much better people than Jordan. Sasha Clark speaking. So Lembica was a woman born in the former uh, Russian Empire. She was actually born in Poland. Um, but, uh, and as a young girl, she taught herself painting, um, but gave it all up when she married into the upper classes uh, of the Russian Empire. And uh, she got married one year before the Russian Revolution. And when the Russian Revolution came, she and her husband fled to Paris with their newborn child. Um, there in Paris, her husband felt he was above actually getting his hands dirty because of course, as nobility, he never had to work. So she went off to uh, find work as most immigrants do and she, worked as a chambermaid, but saw the uh, artisans of Paris selling their wares on the street, and soon she joined them. And a, a patron of the arts, he and his wife, uh, found her and uh, supported her and introduced her to um, a teacher who took her into his studio. And soon she was having shows of her own, and the story develops from there. You should mention that Lempica is Jewish. 
it was unclear to me if she was no 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 she was jewish okay she was very jewish and she knew that being jewish she had to hide her identity because she knew she'd get in trouble and her husband was not jewish right and also um there was also you know she she loved her husband very much but she also fell in love with this singer Raffaella that just completely knocked her socks off and most of the paintings that she made were of Raffaella that were very erotic and um the cast Eden Espinosa as Tamara Olympica, Amber Iman as Raffaella, Andrew Simonski as her husband and George Abood was her teacher and Natalie Joy Johnson was trying to get together a gay um bar restaurant for people because you know gays were frowned upon back then and uh, the, the, her patrons were Nathaniel Stampley and Beth Level. Now, the thing is, I was kind of like, there was, they could have done so much more with this, but they, they didn't take advantage of all the conflicts around her. It's like, this kind of happened and that kind of happened. They kind of glossed over this and glossed over that. And it's just like, it was not Sunday in the Park with George, basically. So I was disappointed, but again, it was nice to hear about this woman I knew nothing about, and her drawings were like extraordinary, and the cast was incredible. So I mean, I'll give it a I'll give it a happy face minus. I mean, I probably should. Oh, and Raja Feather Kelly, whom I just adore, was the choreographer, and Paloma Young did the costumes, which were absolutely fabulous. I gave it a happy face minus. Oh, you too. S. Ashler Gelman's Scarlet Dreams explores our new virtual reality. Milo and his sister Liza have created this virtual exercise program called Real Fit. Milo's husband Kevin had one successful off-Broadway play and is having a hard time coming up with another one. Mostly he just mopes around the house, so Liza wants Kevin to test out their program. Milo isn't sure if Kevin tends to go either overboard or vegetate, but Liza convinces Milo to use Kevin. Kevin picks Scarlett to be his coach. It's kind of like Peloton. He really dives into the exercise program and gets more and more fit, which bodes well for Milo and Liza's creation. If out of shape Kevin can turn into an Adonis, then it's perfect for anyone. Soon Kevin and Scarlett develop a real relationship. They bond over Kevin and other things. Meanwhile, Milo is having trouble with his employees at his real fitness studio called Whole Body. Many interesting questions are raised about dependence on social media and the virtual world and how it affects people's lives. This was fascinating and so well acted by Brittany Belazier, Andrew Keenan Bolger, Caroline Lelouch, and Boris Anthony York. And I give this a happy face plus you have no idea where it's going. Shimmer and Herringbone by Talking Band, this is their 50th anniversary, is written by Alan Maddow and Paul Zimmet in association with the Mabu Mind Show. This story is, is a very avant-garde experimental theater as you would expect from the Talking Band. There's a store, which is like a vintage store or a thrift shop, elegant thrift shop with lots of glimmering clothes. And there are lots of older people, elderly people come to this shop and buy and they try also. And there's a beautiful, there's a film in the beginning which where they are trying in their own micro apartments, different kind of clothes and it's fascinating. So they want to buy very glimmering clothes because they are old and they don't want to be old. They think they will change to a new self of themselves. And then they encounter people whom actually they have known before, but they behave that they don't know them. And some of them avoid each other. And then, then finally their memories or whatever they were faking have come back. And all of them had been like friends for a very long time, lovers and all. And the beautiful clothes they wear and the, the trio of uh, a string trio, which is really, really nice. And this show, you know, there's like a, uh, a Tina Shepard, isn't it? Louis Smith, Jack Weatherhall, wonderful, wonderful James Tigger. Ferguson, who always tried to talk to one character named Lily, you know, and she just she just keeps running away. And then Grace, 
Tina Shepard. It, it's not, yeah, Tina Shepard. She is like running away from Lily. It's, it's just like a very in, interesting, absurd kind of encounters and a little bit like a, a, a denial of people knowing each other because I think they do not like their old age. And uh, it's very fascinating. I, I just really, really enjoyed it very much. I haven't really seen lots of uh, talking band shows, but I, I really, really loved it. It's a happy, happy face. This is Mark Sabat's review of Epic Players Spring Awakening. The neurodivergent Epic Players are putting on Stephen Sater Duncan Sheik's musicalization of Frank Vatican's 1891 Spring Awakening drama of the fatal confusions of adolescents experiencing puberty without useful guidance from their guardians. The romantic songs by Seder and Sheik explore the ambiguities and dangers of romantic attraction. This particular production is the most intimate of those that I've seen. We feel like the whole show is happening on a grave, a haunting and appropriate image for this tragic show. The large cast is so wonderful creating their characters. The young director, Travis Burby, does a great job of handling a large group of performers and making the structure of the play and the songs, especially at the beginning of the show, much clearer than in other productions. The lighting effects and some special scenic touches dazzled me. This is the best production of the epic players that I have seen. I highly recommend it. Major happy face. And I saw another brilliant show. It's called La Musica du M, written by Marguerite Duras, one of the, my most favorite writers in the whole world. It plays takes place in a hotel room about two lovers who have separated a while ago. And now they are meeting again, either by chance or, or they planned it. That wasn't very clear to me. And there are two people only. He, his name is Taylor Valentine, and she, Matilda Woods. And he enters first, he's very elegantly dressed in a nice face, nicely lit. And uh, and he speaks on the phone in French, which we don't understand, unfortunately. And then in a while, she shows up, very elegant woman. They were married uh, and they cheated uh, with each other. He met a foreigner and he just, you know, had a little uh, crush on her. And she had the habit of going alone to bars, always alone. And he like was, was always suspicious that she's having another affair. But at this time of their life, they are separated. And the man, Valentine, he really, really wants to possess her again, wants her back. But you know, Dura's writing is all about longing, which is unfulfilled. The longing stays for the rest of their life. There's a desire, there's a passion, and it's beautiful poetry, and it's a wonderful, wonderful play. It's very nicely done, brilliantly directed by Jessica Barr, and great acting. Everybody should go and see the play. Some people don't like Margaret Duras. They might not like it, but I just loved it, and I'm always going to go back to this. Uh, and it's also done by Blessed, Blessed Unrest. And I usually, Eva invites me many times, and I hardly ever go because I don't know anything about them. But next time, I will join it. It's a happy, happy face. The wonderful Retro Productions is putting on Christy Perfetti Williams' Betty and the Jockette Spinning Records at the Holiday Inn, which is a fictionalized account of a real all-female radio station, W-H-E-R, in a Holiday Inn in Memphis, Tennessee. Betty is the main DJ who plays jazz and thinks rock and roll is a fad. This doesn't bode well, as it looks like they will get an exclusive interview with that up-and-comer Elvis Presley, because this is taking place in 1956. Kit, who does everything at the station, is hoping to do the interview on her morning show, but Sam, who owns the station, gives it to the more seasoned Betty. Dottie, who is in charge of advertising, is in a tizzy because her copywriter ran off and got married. She needs a new copywriter fast or she will lose an important soap ad. Luckily, Catherine, or new girl, as they call her, comes wandering in and is pretty quick with coming up with commercials, so they just snap her right up. Things get even more chaotic when Ben, Elvis's record promoter, comes in and happens to have had worked at the station back in the day and has a past history with Betty. 
Esther appears to be Sam's assistant, but all she seems to do is carry a stack of books around for no reasons. Emotions run high. Where is Elvis? And what is Betty wearing? Lauren Barber's set and Vivian Galloway's costumes really put us back to a 1956 radio station. And the cast was fantastic. This was such a good show about a moment in time I had no idea about. Happy face minus. We just finished seeing Theater Breaking Through Barriers, I Ought to Be in Pictures, written by Neil Simon at Theater Row. It's this wonderful story about this uh, daughter who hasn't seen her father in 16 years after he abandoned them in New York to go to Hollywood to become a writer. And he, the, the father, Herb, he hasn't written in a while. He's got writer's block. He's got a girlfriend named Steph who comes in once a week. And he's very startled by this daughter who has so much confidence. She just wants to be an actor. She ought to be in pictures. And it doesn't matter that she has no experience. She just thinks it'll happen. And she has this habit of talking to her dead grandmother. And it's how their relationship develops and turns into and it's really quite moving and the actors are wonderful you have Mackenzie uh, Morgan Gomez Libby she's in a wheelchair and you've got Steffi the girlfriend Pamela Sabau and Chris Torn or Thorne plays the dad and it takes place in April of 1980. It's a wonderful play filled with relationships between children between brother, sister, father, mother, and it's it's just a wonderful, deeply humane play. Yeah, it's full of those wonderful Neil Simon, you know, glib quips and everything. But underneath it all, there's real, you know, heart tugging moments. I wanted to, I wish I had a flashlight wrote down. Maybe I should look up the script because I want to repeat a lot of these wonderful quotes to friends of mine and watch them stare stare at me like I'm crazy, but they're wonderful, meaningful, heartfelt quotes about what it is to be a human being, what it is to have a life. I just, I enjoy this play immensely. Yeah, and it's basically, you got this, which I can relate to, a very optimistic daughter with this very negative father. And in my case, I'm an optimistic mother with a very negative son. So when, when, when two <laughs> emotionally, you know, over the top people, butt heads, it's quite interesting to behold. So I am giving this, the acting, the, everything about this was so wonderfully done. This gets a major happy face from me. Interestingly enough, this is a play that I could see again. And I, I feel I would, in fact, would like to see it again. So what do you give it? A happy face? Uh, what, what face do you give it? I give it many happy faces because it had so much going on. A Kugler staff meal has oversharing, undersurving circumstances as a couple sitting in a coffee shop develop a relationship. Minna and Ben end up at a restaurant where the waiter and customer seem to disappear. The waiter is lost in the dark and confusing wine cellar. Later at a staff meal, the two servers tell the new waiter the, the, the inspiration of the owner Gary Robinson's philosophy of service to others and flights of fancy. While Christine the cook creates fabulous and simple foods, vagrants and other mysterious people pop up. This is one of those WBE weird but enjoyable plays. It is not to understand but savor the quirky yet tender musings of these characters in search of answers. The acting was phenomenal, as they were the only ones who knew what was going on, even if their characters didn't. Lots was left up to the audience and their imagination. I give this a major happy face. At the New Victory is I Wish, a unicorn theater production in association with Le Gâteau Chocolat. And it was created by Le Gâteau Chocolat and Rachel Bagshaw and Serial Davies starring Jordan Lavinier, and uh, narrator is voiced by Julian Clary. Effie grants wishes to make everyone happy, and she shows off three of them. 
magic mirror to girl with hot, who with low self-esteem that makes her look gorgeous every time she looks at it. And then clothes, shoes, and um, looking really pretty to a girl who wants to go to a ball. And to a little boy not growing up and flying because he never wants to get old and grow up and change like all the other people. But all of these wishes blew up in Effie's face as did as they did more harm than good. So the solution is to take the wishes back and instead give everyone fairy powers so humans can grant each other's wishes and be kind and pay it forward. This was such a cute show and you know, it, it, the costumes were very flashy and, and it's for kids four to seven, but it's not for someone with vertigo. I mean, the lights never stopped. I mean, there were the sparkling lights, flashing light, moving, flashing things all through the, the whole thing. I watched the whole thing like this the entire time so I could just see, you know, Effie. But really, I think their kids will love it. I mean, the kids, these four to seven year olds, not a shriek amongst them. They were just riveted. So, I mean, I'm gift for the kids. And the parents having, you know, quiet children for a change, I give it a major happy face. But for me and my vertigo, I'm giving it a happy face minus. And now for theater listings. So the other La Musica Duzième by Margaret Dura is taking place from May 16th to May 26th at Torn Pages. Closing May 19th is Redemption Stories and Modern Witches and Brian Hemingway. Closing May 25th is Twelfth Night at Axis Theater Company. Closing May 26th is a final toast at Chain Theater. And Club Sum will be closing on May 28th. So, uh, closing June 1st are Small Acts of Daring Invention by Mason Holdings at Here. I love this company. And it's inspired by the life and work of Dare Wright and is an image-rich, musically-driven exploration of the space between this life and the next. The play teases the realness of the unreal and investigates the endless resources of the imaginative realm. With one actress and four puppeteers, Small Axe follows an unmoored woman adrift in the isolation and fog of forgetfulness towards an encounter with their long-lost companions and life. I can't wait to see it. Uh, and also closing June 1st is the actors at Theater Row. Closing June 2nd, the brief life and mysterious death of Boris III, King of Bulgaria at 59th, 59th Street, the lonely few at MCC. Some special events is Tosses at 50 is having their pride party May 20th. The Actors Temple is having their comedy benefit with Bon Greenberg on May 20th. And at the Y, we've got Merrily We Roll Along director Maria Friedman in conversation with Jonathan Groff May 19th and uh, Cabaret Eddie Redmayne and Gail Rankin in conversation with MTV's Josh Horowitz, and that's May 20th. And then from June 1st to 3rd is Lyric and Lyricist, Wonder of Wonders, celebrating Sheldon Harnick. Lots going on. Next show will be June 1st. <laughs>